You know, I am the director at our Texas Cryptologic Center, and being one of the senior managers there, I really couldn't in good conscience continue on with my travel and be known as serving in Orlando when I would have members of my staff getting furlough notices potentially the next morning. So made the decision, no, I won't go. Uh, so I was there virtually on a stick. <laughs> and Jeannie and Mary took me all around the conference. We <laughs> had photographs taken with all the esteemed members they could find. And I thought, well, you know what? It is really much better to be in person. So here I am in Charlotte making up for my time not being in Orlando. But we are thrilled to be here tonight. Let me introduce my esteemed colleagues. Mary Norris Thomas, who is CEO of the Fleming Group. And Mary's group does a lot of different projects, both with the government and other corporate entities. She uh, is too shy to share with you that her organization has received numerous awards, including Top Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, she also is very well known as one of the authors of the handbook, and her chapter is often cited, and she is recruited by academic institutions to uh, present her chapter and her work in their programs. So Mary, we're glad to have you here. And then we have Dr. Jeannie Farrington, who is president of Jay Farrington and her consulting group. She's all over the place, both in hard copy and soft copy, and is an author of award-winning publications, and currently is running a series in PIQ so if you'd like to have some interesting articles to read, do check with Jeannie after our session. So that's a little bit about us and our background, uh, but we do want to first do one little bit of administrivia. Did everyone get a chance to download or to pick up a copy of one handout package? Everybody have one? Well, they're going tonight for the bargain price of a smile. So here you go. Is anyone else? Okay. You do need these for the first part of our session. Okay, we have a smile. Okay, problem. Problem. I like it when you kind of, you know, sum up. It's really nice. Just kind of really have anybody else? We got, oh, we have more. And we have specs back here, right? Smile more, a little bigger, a little more groveling is good. That's great. Are you feeling neglected, overlooked, packed? We won't. We'll make sure. Everybody's good. All right, so we do. Oh, please, we need. Okay. Grovel. A little more groveling is good. I love that. Good. Very good. All right. But tonight is really all about you. So here's the hard part. Put the handouts down. Because I know, you know, isn't that always what happens? Hand them out, we're immediately looking because you think there's going to be a test later, which there is. Um, so just chill out and relax. We want to know a little bit about you because tonight really is all about you. So now it's time for you to talk with me. So give me a little bit about your background. How many of you are managers? Bless you, bless you. And how many of you instructional designers? Okay, students, parents. Okay, wish they were parents. Yeah. Wish they weren't parents. <laughs> just checking, just checking. Practitioners, how many would of you would consider yourselves uh, human performance practitioners? And let's just kind of do an assessment of the group. How many of you would identify yourselves as emerging HPT practitioners, <coughs> seasoned, geezers? Okay. <laughs> just checking, just checking. All right, so you have a sense of where we are with that, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, what we want to do this evening, we do have three objectives. and. Beginning any session, as you know, we have to have our objectives, but I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, but we will cover these objectives in this format. So what we want to do really is spend some time addressing the what. And there is an acronym I'd like you all to uh, make sure that you know, and that is E. See 
as you measured it tomorrow. I measure it. Claire measures it. Jeannie measures it. The blue smurf measures it. We should all get the same value from it. They should be enduring, lasting. These are not sugar fixes. Self-correcting also. That our evidence bases, our evidence-based practices may change, but they change with the situation, and they still bring the value that they claim to. And finally, as I said before, they are safe. So, how do you know if your practices have these key ingredients? I think it's the first page in your handout <coughs> will cover some tools and tips about the essentials of evidence. I'm going to go over one of them. The rest are there for you to present, uh, get at your uh, leisure. Uh, They often operate in concert. We may have a insight, intuition. We may give it a little bit of thought. We 
we may check at a respected source, an authority figure that we have respect for. Uh, we may go out and test it a little bit, gather some data. Okay? Now we still haven't made a decision. We put some reasoning into it. We interpret those results. So our decisions come from maybe some insight, maybe some logic, <coughs> some data, empiricalism, empiricism. The scientific method, for example, is exactly that. We think it's totally empirical. Maybe the measurements are, but data do not make decisions. People make decisions, which means that your brain, your reasoning comes into play in evaluating the data, in diagnosing a situation, and in deciding upon a course of action. Now, there are a few other tips in there, browse them as you will. <coughs> but I'd like to go on. Oh, we found a slide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's magic. I forgot magic. Yeah. Yeah. And now magic happens. So we are now going to try to apply some of these in a hallmark, hallmark demand of HTP. Anybody ever heard this? Show me the evidence. Yeah? Well, short phrase, deceptively short, deceptively simple, highly formidable data. Let's break it down. And I'm going to do it backwards. Show me the evidence. I'm going to start with the evidence part. What is evidence? You think of evidence, what comes to mind? O.J. Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's a, that's an actually an example. The judicial system actually has rules of evidence. We don't. For good or for bad, maybe good in this case. Um, I will call upon another philosopher for a definition, this one is called uh, Karl Popper, defines evidence as support for a proposition derived from empirical observation or experience. You look up the definition in uh, the OED, in Webster's, in Wikipedia, you'll find similar words to support that. We have two key things in that definition. And that is, what is the effect of the evidence? It provides support for a proposition, or it may refute something. So we have the effect. The second key word in that definition is, what is the source of the evidence? In this case, empirical observation. I saw it, I felt it, I counted it, and other people can do the same thing. So, we have a feeling of evidence now. Show. How is evidence shown? Well, the word show and the word evidence are just To achieve the effect of the support for a proposition, evidence must be shown. I must be able to see it. You must be able to see it. You must be able to go see it. And if you don't see it, it's open to, to be refutable. It's not immutable. Now, we get to the most, the absolutely most important part. Obviously, it's me. <laughs> me, 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 me. What's, what is your job? What's your role here? You got the evidence? Someone showed it to you? 
You are the judge. You have to decide. You draw upon those key ingredients in evidence-based practices. You consider what you were shown. You decide whether you're going to accept that, whether you're going to trash it, how you're going to interpret it, and what your course of action is going to be. So, show me the evidence. Formidable to do. Recap. Your busting kit. Evidence-based practices. Valid, reliable, meaningful, consistent. They last. Self-correcting. They are reputable or they can be uh, supported. And they don't kill anything. <laughs> we consider how do we know? How did we come by that decision? We evaluate the evidence for ourselves. That's an internal process. Data do not speak for themselves. Beware of unsupported things. Remember Carl, uh, Carl Sanders' purse? Question authority. Clients are not our guinea pigs. Let's don't experiment on them. And finally, if you cannot defend it, here we get back sort of to the judicial theme that Roger brought up. If you can't make a case for it, you can't defend it, don't do it. Now, just a brief overview of some of the things in your busting kit. Hang on to it. You're going to need it. We are now going to put some of these busting kit tools and tips into action. For that, I'm going to turn you back over to Cliff. Thanks. <clears throat> so are you all comfortable in your seats? Relaxed, chilled out, right? Okay. Part of the goal of the Charlotte chapter, I understand, one of your priorities is networking, right? So you're about to network now. So what I'm going to ask you to do in 60 seconds is to stand up, look around the room, have your uh, myth-busting kit in your hand. Just stand up, come on, stand up, look around the room, look around the room. Be scanning now. This is where it gets challenging. I'd like you to form up into triads, so look for two other really brilliant looking people. <laughs> All right, you have 60 seconds. Please form triads. Let's walk around. We're all good, and whatever group you have, the number works just fine. Don't worry about it. You're okay. You're okay. So there are three things that you're going to need to do. You're going to need to discuss. You're going to need to use your myth busting tips and tools to make a determination, and then you're going to need to be able to defend that determination. You have before you nine different claims. We're going to ask you in the next 15 minutes to at least address two. Just two. If you're a particularly talented and gifted group and you get through that in record time, feel free to pick another claim. So you can do as many as you like of the nine that are presented. First, you're going to talk among yourselves what is going on in that particular claim, what tips and definitions from your myth-busting kit can you apply, and you're going to make a determination if that claim is, is confirmed, meaning it does have, it is supported by evidence, or is it busted, that you do not have evidence to support it, and you'll discuss your rationale. Are we clear on the task? This is where you make an audible sound. Are we clear? Excellent. Crystal. Time begins now. You have 15 minutes. And feel free to sit down if you like.
rhetorical device to draw his readers in. And he says, how many times have you heard training managers say that only 10% of what we are teaching transfers to the workplace anyway? He says, how many times have you heard people say that? And then he goes on to talk about other things. He goes on to talk about actually the role of the manager in making sure that stuff transfers in, in the workplace. And these are observations that he is making. He's making stuff up as his keyboard based on his own personal experience. And he's not claiming to do anything else. There's not a single citation in his article. There are no studies that are referenced. He's just saying, hey, you know, how many times have you heard people say blah, blah, blah? Well, let's talk about that. Rhetorical device to make you interested in reading his article. Okay? So that was... Am I okay? So this was 1982, okay, a while ago. This was picked up by a couple of guys who surprised me, <laughs> who quoted it in a peer-reviewed journal in 1988. Now it becomes truth. Two professor types writing a peer-reviewed journal mentioned that only 10% of training transfers. Wow, that's pretty serious stuff. So then the next thing that happens is other people start quoting that and citing it. It's been cited a gazillion times. But if you go back and read the original, which is why it's a good idea to do that, you go back and read the original, you'll find out he's not saying that at all. Not really. Just kind of getting your interest. So we were a little shocked, actually. Mary and I were talking on the phone, and she's like, really? That was in a peer review journal? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> here it is. Here's the citation. And so, in fact, I think we have it here for you. Baldwin and Ford, 1988, Transfer of Training. In Personnel Psychology, thank you very much. They actually read that one ahead of publishing the article. But at the same time, the, the, you know, the research that we've seen that after training, the transfer goes down if it's not used. Right. So I yes, could see does. where somebody could be picked up on that fairly easily. Right. Absolutely. When I read the article on does was this a myth or not, I had several recent meta-analyses to look at where they looked at all different factors in measuring the transfer of training. And what they found was that it depends on whom you ask. If you ask the students, the transfer numbers are pretty high. If you ask their managers, the transfer may, transfer numbers are lower. If you ask their peers, they're way low, <laughs> way low. So it depends on whom you ask, and it also depends on how long after training you ask them. Soon after training, numbers are higher. Longer after training, numbers are lower. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff. And what actually it turns out is there is no reasonable way at this time for us to have a generalized number to say, oh, about this much of training in general transfers. It's not, we, we don't have the ability to do that right now. Even in that case, for it to be evidence-based, you wouldn't take their word for it anyway. You'd have to observe their behavior and watch the transfer of training. I imagine that. That's and right. So, I mean, to get to that point, <laughs> yeah. you'd take a heck of an investment. That's a, that's a very good point. The, the self-report data is notoriously unreliable. Yeah, so we probably need to move on to uh, number, number two. two. Sure. Um, uh, number two, the claim was multitasking improves productivity. No, okay, guys, let's think about this. <laughs> so, um, it's on job descriptions. It's on job requirements. Must be able to multitask. Okay, somebody thought that this was essential for job success. How many say confirm? What? What is wrong with you people? What? There are no multitaskers out here? <laughs> okay. How many say Nobody <laughs> takes the drive somebody here. How many say busted? Busted. Clicking. Okay. <laughs> this, in fact, according to the current literature, is a misnomer. We really can't do or don't do more than one thing at a time. Our vigilance is to one thing. We may flip back and forth, which actually impairs productivity. Because
because you have to go reacquire the target every time you flip from one thing to another. There's a startup lag to reacquire whatever you were doing. Productivity instead is maximized when you focus on the task and then finish it. Okay, now actually some of us actually can wash the baby and do the laundry at the same time or have the laundry going at the same time. However, we are not actually totally doing the baby and loading the laundry at the same time. So, our assessment of this was busted. And I think we are in agreement. Very good. Look, look, they're in the back going, yeah, we got that one. So, for any of you who have this on your job description, you need to go get that corrected immediately. <laughs> right, right. Okay, next step. Number three, claim minimally guided learning does not work. Minimally guided learning does not work. Okay, confirmed? <coughs> Doesn't work. Speak with confidence. Speak with confidence. All right, why doesn't it work? Why does it work? What are you talking about? I've read that it works if you have structured reflection afterwards and people reflect on what they learn. And mm -hmm. there's some sort of a structured, formal way to do that. So in other words, you know, you throw them in, they sink or swim. But you take some time to coach them after. So sink or swim, coach them after, and mm -hmm. goodness. Okay, a little structure at the end. But it works. It works at the end. Okay. Okay. Other other thoughts? Success is a horrible teacher, so we must learn by failure. We learn by failure. <laughs> I must say that that is <laughs> true. <laughs> I, I was going to say we, we learn by doing something, um, and if you do it well, then you you know you learn that you've done it correctly. But oftentimes, if you mess it up, that's how you really learn what to do better the next time. Yeah, we do sometimes learn by the school of hard knocks. That's exactly true. However, here's the thing. Another way of talking about minimally guided learning is we're talking here about discovery learning. We're talking here about constructivism, for example. <laughs> we got gigglers back there. Okay, now, <laughs> these two methods, it turns out, turn up about every 50 years with a new name. So it was discovery learning, and then later it was constructivism. These methods work really well for about 5% of the population. And that is people who already have a lot of experience in the area, so they just need to add a little bit to what they know. Or it works really well. Now, by really well, I'm talking about effective, efficient instruction. Okay, so that's what we're looking for, is effective, efficient instruction. So, if I know something about it already, and I'm just adding to what I already know, and I have pretty much domain-specific expertise, then give me, just give me a goal and give me some information and leave me alone and I will learn it. Also, if I'm in the top 5% of the IQ bracket in America or the world, it also works well. Because people like that, you almost can't screw up their learning by letting them do it on their own. In fact, that's the best way for them to learn. Everybody else, okay, so 95% of us actually learn more efficiently, more effectively in an environment where learning is more structured. Yes? Just, just to clarify what you're saying, is it 5% of the people or 5% of the situations? 5% of the people. <coughs> See, it feels like it'd be 5% of the situations because we're all... No in a given thing. situation, or how about that? You have a class, you have a, a whole class of right. people, a thousand people in the class. All right, the top 5%, give them a goal, give them information, get out of their way. Everybody else, give them structure. Or you've got a thousand people, and there's a few who have domain expertise. Give those people a goal and information, get out of their way. Everybody else, give them structure. But if you take those thousand people, it depends on the subject that you're introducing to them. If they don't know anything about, let's say that this is new, mm -hmm. especially for novice learners, mm -hmm. especially for novice learners, this is the case. Mm -hmm. Those with 
more expertise, need less structure. Okay. Yeah. The way I learned that, it was called an inductive learning strategy, and they said, yes, it's less efficient, it takes longer, but the retention is higher. Nah. We need the evidence. We need more evidence for that. The, the thing is, here's the thing that it's happens. In my notes from graduate school. Huh? But then it must be true. <laughs> oh, okay. Notes from graduate school has got to be true. And we're not going to ask how long ago that was. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> there's, another, there's another factor here, and that's cognitive overload. A lot of these programs where they kind of throw you in the deep end and have you figure it out for yourself, what really happens a lot is cognitive overload. The person is like trying to uh, deal with many different situations at a time, and then that makes it take longer actually to learn the thing than it would if we structured it for them and provided a little more scaffolding and guides. So that's that one. Okay. Next, Next. Dr. Thomas. Oh, virtual meetings. Now, how many, <laughs> how many of you have ever been involved in, in virtual meetings? Oh, gosh, it's all like all over oh, the place, right? So we all use it. It must be great and wonderful. How many say confirmed? They're so much more effective and efficient. Why don't you, why don't you define effective and efficient? I will. I will. <laughs> but the claim was more efficient and effective. Cost effective. Cost effective. Uh, something cannot be cost effective unless it's also a cost thing and it yields a desirable outcome. Like, I would disagree with that. Why? I would, I would say it is, yes. There, is there a cost savings to meeting virtually? Yes. 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 But it's is, what, is, what about the outcome of meeting, of the meeting virtually? You've got a group. You have to make a decision. You can meet face-to-face. -face. You can meet over the phone, over Skype, over VTC, whatever. So, do groups who meet face to face make better decisions, more likely to be the, the right decision for less money than folks that meet virtually? The claim is virtual meetings are more efficient and more effective compared to face to face. Next. Busted? Busted? Confirmed. Um, Ooh, split decision. Well, split decision. What's, the out, but you have to, what's the outcome of the meeting? You, okay. said, you said decisions. These, these, these were, I'm drawing upon sources from experimental studies, from meta-analyses, and from literature reviews. These outcomes, these results were very consistent. That in fact, groups who meet face-to-face made better decisions. The medium may not be the message. However, virtual groups took much longer to come to any decision compared to a face-to-face -face group. Hmm. Who disagrees? Come on. Well, the problem disagree. with this is this doesn't match your question. Yeah, so this is all around efficiency and effectiveness. And that's this is all around um, faster and cheaper. And yeah. Efficient. Yeah. It took longer. So that virtual meetings are more efficient and more effective. But, what but in fact, meeting is to make a virtual groups that met virtually were less efficient. But you that's not what we're doing. put a caveat on to it and make the decisions. Of course we're egging you on. Absolutely. <laughs> we got to stir up a little muck and mire in the group. Okay. They are, virtual meetings are sure. not more efficient and they're not more effective. Did the evidence prove that these were structured meetings? Um, because I find that even face-to-face -face meetings without agendas, uh, action plans. They were controlled situations in the experimental research. They were meta-analyses in, in the other studies that I'm citing from. Um, so for the most part, controlled, yes. Therefore, they were given a problem they were given a the conditions under which to do it, face-to-face -face or 
more virtually, computer mediated. And they were trying to um, how long it took them to reach a decision. Oh, another key thing here is these were not teams that had already come together and worked together. Key point here. So it took the groups longer to come to any decision. Um, and the groups that met virtually made more wrong decisions. Again, this was defined experimentally as correct or incorrect. Um, however, the virtual groups were really, really sure they were right. Really confident that they had done a bang up job. Now, given unlimited time, the virtual groups could perform as well as the face to face groups. Yes, experimental studies. A lot of things were controlled. Could these be experiments? Could these be, could the uh, conditions be changed to try under different conditions, under different definitions? Sure. Plus, if you'll note the uh, dates of the citations, these are a little dated. Mm -hmm. We don't have quite the, it, when these studies were done, the technology for doing this was a little more kludgy. B I don't know if any of you are familiar with BTCs. BTC, is that a technical term? Mm -hmm. Kludgy. Kludgy, yeah. Where you all had to go down to the local Kinkos that had um, video transmission capabilities and meet there. So it technically, you did have to travel a little bit. Um, in the updated <coughs> studies, the differences are becoming um, uh, more less different from one another. The, the virtual groups, as we become more accustomed to it, uh, than the face-to-face -face groups. So, so you could have differences based on the savvy, the tech savvy of the groups. You have kids now who would prefer exactly. working in a virtual environment. Exactly. They don't want to interact with the person. The other thing, I'd be interested in the data, the type of meeting, because this is presenting decision-making meetings. Right. It is. It is coming sharing to decision. Information sharing other purposes. That's it is that. not an, uh, an information meeting. It is It is not a strategy meeting. Well, strategy meeting is a decision-making. You do have to come to a decision. Um, it, yeah. And I think you brought up a good point, and that is basically the structure of the meeting itself. Because how many of us in the workplace are basically killed during the work week because we go from one meeting to another meeting and it really feels like a waste of time, right? Because, you know, people don't come with a clear agenda, they come with different expectations, there's no one facilitating that meeting, it's not structured, and after two hours you're like, what did I, you know, those are two hours of my life I will never get back. Have you ever felt that way? That can occur in a face-to-face -face environment as well as a virtual environment. So back to your point, which is absolutely on the mark, which is how are you structuring that time? Do you have processes in place that are going to get to a clear desired outcome? And is everybody on the same page? And have you even considered the dynamics involved? Right? Is there a trust level, a familiarity of folks? And I think as you were bringing up back there, we have more individuals who have a comfort level and a facility with using the technology now than we even did a year, two years ago, right? So we're seeing that coming forward. So the opportunity here is to say, okay, we have some evidence that reached one conclusion, but what are some more current studies that we could be looking at in terms of the technology today? This actually sparked a lot of follow-on studies about given we have this potential gap in effectiveness, what can we do to close that gap? Because virtual meetings are not going to go away. And many of the suggestions and, and observations and experience you brought up were um, brought up in the follow-on experiences and experiments with these, structured familiarity with the equipment, um, uh, protocols for how we're going to conduct the meeting, even more important in virtual meetings. So it did lead to improvement on how our suggestions for improvement, how we would lead those types of movement, uh, meetings. What's the implication of this to online learning? Say more of what you're thinking. No, I was going to say, if you're saying that these are not as effective for making decisions and having more potential 
discussions, um, number of meetings, maybe your instructor, uh, bringing new people together uh, mm -hmm. in an environment where they don't even have interaction. Uh, so what, so what, does it, what does the research tell us about online learning if this is telling us something about um, this approach? From an instructor, I can t answer that from the literature from an instructor standpoint, that it takes much longer to teach an online course than it does a face-to-face -face one. Um, the effectiveness, if you do the end of course, same test, they seem to perform pretty much the same, the face-to-face, -face, given that the same instructor was doing the face-to-face -face course as the um, online course. And I don't know the complete literature on that, and I don't, I know it from the instructor standpoint more than um, the student standpoint. What about the number of learners is a variable in that? <clears throat> Did the, was the virtual classroom affected by number of learners in terms of how effective it was? I was just looking into that some, and uh, there was a, a ballpark of 15 to 25 being ideal, but it was a ballpark and not based on empirical evidence, more based on uh, things that have worked. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Are we ready? We, we can talk more about virtual training later if you want to. There's, there's I do. much more we could, yeah. Yeah, we could uh, go into. But it's not one of our myths, and we've got to get moving. So this one, you guys all know this. Everyone has seven plus or minus two slots in their working memory, correct? Is that correct? What do you think? Well, we had some passion back there. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Decreasing, mm -hmm. um, and the evidence that I've looked at says that the number is getting closer, somewhere to five plus or minus two. Um, An interesting number. So mm -hmm. good, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't be shy. Come on, you've all heard this. Seven plus or minus two, haven't you? How many have heard this? Seven plus or minus two? No, some of you have not. Okay, give it a lot. The majority of you raised your hand when I, when I asked you that. Okay, because it's in the common wisdom, seven plus or minus two, and it comes from an address that this wonderful guy, uh, Miller, gave in 1955, in which he was reminiscing about a bunch of things, and he was talking about how amazing it is that the number seven comes up so often. You know, the seven wonders of the ancient world, and seven deadly seven sins. Seven deadly sins. Uh, he goes on. You can probably think of some examples yourself. But anyway, he's going on and on about all these sevens and how they all show up and how, you know, and, and he's talking about that we have limits to our short-term memory and it's probably seven, maybe plus or minus two, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you say it that way. <laughs> well, because he's a researcher, he has to waffle. And so then, you know, he gives this talk and then it gets written up. And then, once again, people at their keyboards are like, oh, let me cite Miller, 1955. And you see this over and over and over again in the literature, Miller, 1955. What is it? It's not a study. It, it's not something based on empirical evidence. It's just, hey, you know, this might be the case. And even at the end of his art, in, of the talk, he talks about, oh, this is probably just a coincidence, all these seven. <laughs> okay, and yet, it's become an established <coughs> fact that it's seven, plus or minus two, short, Lots in short term memory. Well, yes. There's another thing that also perpetuated that. There are phone numbers. Phone, phone numbers, numbers are in yeah. sevens. Right. You, I have seen um, instruction on how to put together a PowerPoint slide that says don't put more than seven words or oh, yeah. on a right. line seven and don't words. put more than oh, seven yeah. words. That's a rule. That's a, that, 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 and, and so yes. seven turns See. into this rule that comes up over and over again. Don't teach more than seven things at a time. Don't give people more than seven things to remember at a time because that's how much room we have in our short term or working memory. Well, it turns out, bless you, that this young lady back here is more correct with what the current thinking is, it's not that it's decreased, it's three, maybe four times. That's <laughs> all you get. Now that's working memory, okay? You have an infinite amount of story 
storage space in your long-term memory. <laughs> but working memory is the stuff when you're working with new stuff and you're holding it in your mind, trying to massage it around to figure out things that you're learning. To learn new things. That's what working memory is all about. Long-term memory, you have really pretty infinite capacity in there. You may not feel like it, you may not feel like you can always find the things that are in there, but once it's in there for a while, it's still there. It's just that sometimes you have a retrieval problem. Anyway, this one is mostly busted. Yeah, mostly busted, but there is, it is true that there is a limit to short-term memory. It's just that seven plus or minus two is not it. So isn't it interesting how in the world of advertising, if you would ask if their rule is three, you think about commercials, uh, they talk about Walt well, Disney's best practices for helping people find their cars in the parking lot. Um, it's the so they have three. Mm -hmm. right. Working with sales guys, I had one tell me, give me the three key points at the end of every module. He said, I can remember three, three. things. Mm -hmm. And I, ever since then I've done that just because it sounded like such a good idea and because he was a sales guy. <laughs> And that's probably just about as much stuff as you can keep in mind. That's what he told me. Because he sells believe. or because of his boss? <laughs> <laughs> it was the sales figure. It was sales. Uh, are we well, ready for well, number yeah. six? What went wrong here, though? Putting it, tying it back to your Mythbusters? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes? What went, what went wrong with, with this citation, this becoming a rule? Oh, who made him the authority? How, I guess questioning the authority. Is that what you're authority? But people referenced him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he didn't say that in his article. Oh. They he didn't go back and read. References. No, but they didn't go back and read the primary source. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's also generic. Um, so it doesn't get into the learner type or the concepts that are being asked to recall. Oh, but it's a principle. You don't have to do that. It's case closed, seven yeah. plus or minus. You don't have to do that. It's a rule. It's rational. Read the article. He it's, never says that. And it, but, but you have a point. It does seem rational. It mm -hmm. seems like, oh yeah, that sounds about right. right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's rational. That's one of the ways you know. We know by we might know. It's tradition. It's authority. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds logical, rational. All of those. But when we move over into the whole empirical thing, not happening. Right. <laughs> We're going to Go sort of clip six. through a couple, and we can... Because uh, we have some cool stuff we want to do. Yeah, right after this. Um, six. Um, <clears throat> so who, did anyone do six? Things that occur together tend to be learned together. Oh, God, duh. Who, who could say no? You could say no. Anybody say busted? Okay. Way like to two. confirm. We don't oh, the we are, back there say it's yeah, confirmed. Okay, good. Um, and here's my take on it. Um, I looked into this principle of associationism. I traced it back to a, a translation of um, Aristotle back in oh, 350 BC, uh, who articulated um, the principles and associative nature of learning and memory. Uh, follow that thread in the 17th and 18th centuries. You see philosophers talking uh, about this. John Hobbes, Locke, Hume, and others. Uh, we fast forward then into the 19th century, and oh my gosh, then we have empirical evidence. Evan House. Anybody care hear Evan House? Uh, Thorndike. Substantial. Substantial empirical evidence that things that occur together tend to be learned together. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, he was worried it was busted. <laughs> um, and I, I skipped over the data here. Actually, there is an article about this that's referenced there. You can see the uh, progression of that. Mary Norris Thomas. Mm -hmm. That'd be Authority me. figure. <laughs> so I just that is it's a really short one and um, if you got questions let's if we if you don't mind let's take a look at the 10 percent brain number seven only use 10 percent of our brains who took claim seven who talked about that oh come on i know some of you are talking about that because some of you anybody ever hear
hear this? We only use 10% of our brain. Anybody heard the song by Rod Snyder? Oh my God, he made this famous too. Yeah? It's like all over the place. If it's made it to the pop rock, it's gotta be right. Um, well, you know, there's Hepby and Clay, a couple of researchers, tried to count how many versions of this, and after they got to thousands, they stopped. And they thought, well, they, they tested, and they took all these upper class psychology majors to see if they could be duped. They really believed this folklore. And unfortunately, they did. Um, so they found that because of the prevalence of this, the variation of it, the number of sources that claim to cite it with no evidence behind it, it had to be true. It's totally bogus. All right? Busted. Busted. Totally bogus. Now, it may be we only use 10% of our brain some of the time, and maybe not. We don't have the literature to support that. Met what method? Authority? Everybody, you know, people with respect said it was true. Who checked? <laughs> well, I think one of the things is that all of these sites come long before we have the ability to do brain scans and really see the brain changing and, and being used. And so now that we have that actual evidence that shows what's happening in the brain, we're not just guessing about what's happening in the brain. Yes, oh, but you know, yeah, but so why are, is it still perpetuated? Okay, okay right, that's right. How could we be sitting here if we only use 10% of our brain? Okay, we, we can we use be, logic. We wouldn't be breathing, we wouldn't be seeing, we wouldn't be... The problem is nobody knows what 100% looks like. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I think it's amazing. I kind of like I to think it's only 10%, but maybe yeah, there's another 90% there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In some days, I'd be happy if people I work with used 10%. <laughs>
tell me I was good. So that performer becomes dependent upon that confirmation all the time. So it's, it's not that praise is bad. It's that if you're going to do it every time, and you skip once, you skip twice, you're going to see a dip in performance. Will it even out? Yes. And I was trying to uh, exactly. stir up a little trouble in the back when I was sharing, but there's so many popular keynote speakers now that say you need to have four positives for every negative comment shared in the workplace. Have you heard that? You know, it's just make it motivational, making people feel valued and respected, and often if people just hear negative, 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 it demoralizes them. So make sure that you separate the motivational end from a learning or performance objective when you're looking at this. Right? You want to get into that. Yes. The next one. The last, very last one. MBTI Myers Briggs type Oh, I've heard my personal of, favorite. Yeah, I heard discussion about this one. Okay. Reliable and valid instrument. How many say yes? Fabulous. Myers Briggs. Woohoo! How many say no? I don't think so. Awesome. You guys, oh, yeah, you guys pass with flying colors. Not reliable, not valid. Do not use it for hiring, retention, promotion. Don't waste your money. Do not, do not, do not. It is A, not reliable, B, not valid. Okay, enough said. Except us being in social media. media. <laughs> <laughs> How about social media? Okay, we're going to move right along, unless there's any controversy. But we'll take controversy after, because we don't want to keep you too late. All right, where are we? Ah, Dr. Carey, do you want to do this? Do you want me to go quickly? Keep going. No, all right, we're going to, all right, so what we're trying to say here is we do want you to be a myth buster, demand, show me the evidence when somebody says we should do blah, blah, blah. Okay, you look like, what makes you think so? Would be a good question. How do you know? Be professional about it. Don't tell them they're idiots, okay? And then. <laughs> Don't fall for just stuff that sounds good. You know, the flavor of the month kind of stuff. All right, now we're going to talk briefly about transfer and fulfillment. So this is transferring all of this researchy stuff that we're talking about to something maybe practical that can help you can fulfill in your workplace. All right, now you see here on my left, we have the floor. This is one of my favorite characters. This guy is so happy. He's walking along. He's got his little bag of tricks. Those are his performance improvement tricks in there. He's walking along, and you see that he's looking up. But what's happening is right down below him. He's about to walk off a cliff, right? OK, so don't be this guy. Look before you leave. OK, next slide, please. All right, you, just, you have this hand out now. Now, this is, this is here to help you. This is here to help you, and so I want to call your attention to the column over here on the left. Things that work. You'll see it says something about adapted from Farrington 2001. I don't know who that is. <laughs> anyway, this Farrington person said, hey, you know, you should think about what you're doing before you foist it upon others. All right? So before you subject somebody to a training program or the new management speak of the month or whatever the heck it is, let us think before we do it. What makes me think this is a good idea? And all I want to do is get people to think about that first. Okay? So if we look at this, it's like, am I doing this because of folklore? Like, you know, this was something somebody I liked did or something. Right? Or somebody told me this was a good idea. And we're hoping not snake oil. Right? There's a lot of snake oil out there. MBT, MBTI is one piece of snake oil. People are making, and you want to make thousands and thousands of dollars. Become an MBTI practitioner. But you will be peddling snake oil. Not reliable, not valid. Okay? So we, so we want to avoid the things that we, that are either we don't know if they work, or if you really looked, you'd find out that they don't work. That's much worse, all right? The next one is intuition and exploration. Now, this one is perfectly fine. I have a hunch that something will work. Let us explore this. I think if we do thus and so with our management training programs, that it will probably work. 
But okay, what are you doing here? You're being honest. You're saying, I have a hunch. This is my intuition. Here's what it's based on. I think this will work. Not, I am the big consultant in the sky. I have all the answers. This is what we must do. There's a lot of people out there making more money than I am who have the right to do that. Okay, so intuition, exploration. The next one is respected practice. Now, respected practice is a perfectly good thing. This means we don't know exactly why this works, but we've done it repeatedly, whatever this thing is, and it has worked in multiple situations. And I'm really respecting that because I'm seeing that we're getting results. I can't show you empirical studies about why, but we can see that it's working. That's respected practice. And then the last one is evidence-based. Hey, guess what? There's a mountain of evidence that shows that this particular thing is going to work really well. Okay? Now, does that make sense to you? Take a look at what you're doing. And for you, where is it on this list? Is it because you have a hunch? Is it because it's respected? Is it because there's evidence to back it up that you know about? Okay. And then we thought, okay, you know what would be really cool? is if we took purses, tenacity, tradition, authorities, and logic, we put it across this way, and we, say, and we sort of matched these, these two up. And what we came up with was, hey, if you look at the legend down here, the stars refer to things that are more likely to inspire confidence, and the question marks are more likely to inspire questions or possibly be questionable. So you'll see that we have... Um, up here we have a lot of questions. Okay, you get folklore and tradition together, tenacity, we've always done it this way, we have a lot of questions about is this correct? For example, seven plus or minus two, goes right here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we move across here and then you'll see that, okay, now snake oil, this is always bad and always forget it. All right, don't do that. But sometimes things that we've done that came across, you know, the so-called old wives' tales or whatever, like they really work. Like if you chew on willow bark, it will help your headache. You know why? Because willow bark has acetyl salicylic acid in it. You know what that is? Acid. acid. Okay. So sometimes folklore, if we take it all the way over to here, we find out, oh, guess what? It works. Okay, awesome. And then if we get down here, respected practice, you see, as we go across, we have more and more confirmation, more and more confidence that this thing might work. And so, what we are imploring you to do, and, and when we give these talks, we're saying, please, please, think before you make a recommendation about how do I know that this might be helpful. Because as we saw with the stuff that George Miller said about 7 plus or minus 2, or we look at the thing that Jorgensen said about, hey, only 10% of training transfers, and how this stuff gets repeated and repeated, and suddenly it becomes truth and embedded in society. Well, forget that. We have a responsibility to dig a little deeper to find out where these ideas come from and whether they're likely to act, provide the active ingredients that will help people to solve their problems, and to learn more, to, to uh, improve performance. Okay. Then the evidence, and Alice coming back and saying, nonsense. Whoever heard of having the sentence first? And indeed, we implore you, consider the evidence first. If we don't cry nonsense, if we don't consider the evidence first, our practices may tumble. Alice thought otherwise. She said, we'll tumble like a house of cards. So we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> but we have two minutes. Questions, <laughs> comments? Who has a real issue they want to solve in 30 seconds? Where did the Addy model come from? Ooh, good question. World War II. Okay, that's where instructional design came from. Okay. The Addy model. Do you have the answer? No one knows. I think Mike Melinda is researching it, but the last I heard, I heard nobody could actually find it.
find the ADD, i.e., the source of it. The very source of it. It's folklore, the Bible. Oh, you mean the origin? Right no, now? the origin of it. Yeah, follow the thread. That would be that would be an interesting thread to follow. I just wondered if maybe you could that. We got a question right over there. If you want to take on another one that I'd love to dig into, 70-20-10 model, experience, others, and education as a ratio of uh, kind of a, adult learning and learning in a corporate environment. It comes out of CCL and, and Longinger like to cite it. Uh, there was some, there was a just a brief study where they kind of polled senior leaders. Uh, how did you learn, you know, what you learned to become an executive? Oh. And so that became the 70-20-10 mm -hmm. model for, for learning and development, and a lot of folks embrace it. And so everyone on. can hear it go through the, um, the numbers again, 70%? 70-20-10. 70 70 learning, development and education are learning through experience, 70%, mm -hmm. through others or social, you know, coaching, mentoring, that type of thing, 20, and then formal education, 10%. Mm -hmm. So, Center for Creative Leadership likes to, that's that's the mm -hmm. first time I've been able to see it being cited a lot, and Lominger likes to use it as well. It's interesting, you I said that you look what you're selling. It's right. obvious yeah. they're already yeah. making that up. <laughs> <laughs> it's 8 o'clock. Uh, we don't want to keep you past yeah. your evening. Your we enjoy our time with you immensely. Thank you so, so, so very, very much. We do think that the Charlotte chapter really rocks. Charlotte. Charlotte.